guys on, but keep you as well, because I want to be able to see you. You don't want to hear me. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we're going to get to some of the stuff I overlooked just to say I did it, and that way you get your money's worth. Because Sonny doesn't want to give out refunds. No refunds allowed. No refunds. Okay, let's go back to some of the technical stuff. The English word Bible comes from the Greek, la biblica, which means the books. A uh, name well chosen sets of Bibles, a collection of many individual works, and not the product of a single person. In the New Testament, there are 27 books, and in the Old Testament, either 39 in Protestant Bibles, or 46 in Catholic editions. Year after year, the Bible remains the world's largest selling book, averaging 30 million copies a year. Perhaps 150 billion in all since Gutenberg invented the printing press. What is the Bible? It is the inspired word of God in which God reveals himself to us. The Bible illustrates the beliefs and the traditions of communities comprised of priests, prophets, and saints. It is the history of God's relationship with man. It is very diverse in its literary form. It is really a library in its collection of books. It is sacred scripture, a rule for living life. The word of God contained in the Bible are not suggestions, but a rule. It is a classic text. It is beyond any one religion. So three of the major religions in the world, Christian, Jewish, and Muslim, use it as a source of inspiration. I was at a, uh, I just had some sigh for a second, uh, I was invited to a prayer service, a uh, uh, Saturday morning uh, a prayer service at a, at a, at a group, not a reform, a conservative Jewish temple, all about six weeks, no, more than six months, eight weeks ago. And uh, a friend of me knew I was very interested, that's why I was invited to, 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 to attend the, uh, the Shabbat service. So I'm in the area, I'm going, they have a book in, in, in Hebrew, but they also have an English, I'm reading the English version, and I'm instructed, they're singing Psalms. And I look at it, we're singing the same grand things in our church, and it's the same plastic words. And isn't that wild that the you know, people of the Catholic faith, the people of the Jewish faith, are praising God in the same text, in the same source? I think it's fantastic. I really do. And I think that gives a lot of validity to what we're doing. And it's not just us, because the Jews are singing the same praises, the Muslims are singing the same praises. We must be doing something right. I mean, it's got to be. Otherwise, not three. One of us is going to make a mistake, not three of us. So the three different religions are basically the same. I mean, when you say, wow, yeah. you sing the songs that I sing, I think it's fantastic. You really do. All right. Uh, moving very right along. Uh, brief survey of the Old Testament. Uh, Genesis describes a prehistory of God's call and preparation for people and creation of patriarchs. Exodus portrays the mighty deeds of the deliverance of Israel from Egypt and the giving of the covenant. Also came out the great musical Joseph and the technical team called. Le Leviticus describes the obligations of the covenant while Numbers adds more laws and continues the search of Israel time in the desert. Do not wait. You can do it. What I'm saying is Leviticus and Numbers will put you to sleep faster than any sleeping pill made to man. Really, I mean, it, it can put you to sleep that quick. Deuteronomy is written by Moses, serves to deepen the sum of the meaning of the covenant for Israel later on in the history. It's amazing how Moses in Deuteronomy writes about his death. That's pretty cool. How the heck do you write about your death? Moses passed away, and then Moses wrote it. That's what I said, the point I was making before. Is it the word of God, the inspired word of God? Yes. Is it totally actual? Yes. But yeah, there's a few points in there where I would question it. And Ramos is writing about his own death. There's one of them. You can just argue with them. You have an argument. Uh, the historical books explore the living out of the covenant and the promised land. Joshua describes the conquest. Judges the settlement and struggle for survival. Daniel the going need for and the coming of kings and Saul and David. And the and David and kings trace the religious fidelity of the kings that followed David down to the monarchy. Test. Let's see how good you are in Bible literature. 
So Jesus uh, died, rose three days, and resurrected, and with the ascension went to heaven. One other biblical figure never died. Never died. Ah, uh ah, -huh, uh -huh. oh, ah. Uh -huh. What's that? Bingo! She's got it. Elijah. Elijah, the Old Testament, again, again, it was written about Jesus, a famous prophet. When it's time for him to go, he has a, his prophet waiting, Elisha, and he gives Elisha his shawl and escape. And all of a sudden, the skies open up and a fiery chariot comes on down. Elijah gets on the fiery chariot, and the fiery chariot goes back into heaven. Did he die? Not unless he fell out of the chariot. <laughs> Again, you got to you got you got to you, you have your head, mind tuned into these little things because uh, it's that that you know more than somebody else. God forbid. That's not the point. Uh, the point is, is that at some point you start marrying these things together, and now you're doing a picture. Uh, again, I can take a, a second. Uh, I'm a follower of St. Ignatius Loyola. Uh, my Jesuit training for one, but forget the Jesuit training. I, 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 we're on the same way of life. One of the things that Ignatius uh, says you should do in, in your reading of the Bible is, and your prayer life is contemplate what you're reading. Uh, what, I, what am I saying? Well, for example, the Gospels tell us the story of Zacharias. Zacharias is the tax collector. Jesus walks into the town. Zacharias was, you know, five foot two, eyes are blue, he's wearing this shake sack, whatever. So he has to climb a tree just to see Jesus. And Jesus says, come on down, I've been to your house tonight. Close your eyes and picture that scene. Don't read it. Think about it. Picture it. See Jesus, you got 10, 20, 30 people around. Hey Jesus, hey, da, 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 glad they don't and everything else like that. Zacharias, being well, because he's so small, can't see Jesus for anything. So he hikes up, he, he, he hikes up the shore, whatever, and he climbs a sycamore tree so he can see Jesus. And Jesus looks up and says, Come on down, silly man. I'm having dinner at your house tonight. You gotta close your eyes and picture that scene. You just gotta visualize that whole thing. You gotta sit there and just say, Wow. I mean, here's a guy who I'm trying to see him. Not only does he see him, but he can be the host. We can be the talk of the town. Well, not really talk because he's a tax collector, so everybody hates him. But the reality is, he will be the talk of the town, right? Jesus, right? It sounds like, wow, that must have been some spread. My point is, as Ignatius would say, is when you're reading, when you're reading a story like this, especially the Gospels, especially where you see Jesus doing something, uh, you got to close your eyes and be there. Jesus feeding a crowd of 5,000. So Jesus is out walking along and he's got a lot of people following him. In fact, enough people following him that can fill a basketball stadium. And he's by the shores of Tiberias and he's walking, he's walking, he's looking and he says, oh God, we got a lot of people here, what are we doing? So uh, he asks his apostles, hey guys, uh, is there a fast food place around here? Is there a McDonald's around here? Can, can, we, can we pick up some fast food, fries, burgers to go? Really? I, when I read that, that's exactly what I'm thinking. Jesus is saying, can we, is there a fast food joint around here? Can we pick up fries and brews? Something like that. I said, no, we're too far out. Anybody here got any food? Yeah, we got this little kid over here. He's got best. He's got some bread and fish in it. Jesus, oh wow, that's cool. I, could, I, I got stuff to work with now. I don't have any special sauce, no ketchup, but guess what? We'll do. We'll do. So Jesus blesses it, and the apostles start to ship it. Now, I got a basket with five loaves and three fishes. Can you picture five loaves and two fishes, whatever, okay? Can you just picture that? And every time the apostle reaches in the basket, da -da, one is there again. Da -da, there's another one there again. You got to picture that. And that's when you really can say, wow, that's, a, that's something. <laughs> The people who were there, some might have said, wow, so, <coughs> sorry. some might have said, wow, some might have just said, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's a magician, this is all a show. 
uh, again, my point is, when you're when you're into these gospel, when you're into the gospels, you're into Jesus doing something. Um, yeah, put yourself there. Perfect. Yeah, I'm just going to give you one. Idea. We'll talk about this in the New Testament. John chapter eight. John chapter eight is the story of a blind man. The quick synopsis is. So Jesus and the apostle walking in town, there's a blind man there, Jesus cures the blind man, the Pharisees give up, the mother follow, and don't want to do anything with him. That's a long story. My point is, close your eyes and think. The gospel is now going right from memory. Jesus and his apostles walk into town and they pass a blind man. Stop. The apostles asked, Jesus, there's a blind man over there. Can you cure him? Now, does the apostle say, hey, Jesus, there's a blind man over there. Can we help him? No. So what is it about? Well, the apostles saw an object. They did not see a human being. And that's just the first sentence of John 9 that you can imagine visualize. That's my point. First, one sentence only. I took all of that out of one sentence. That's what I mean. You gotta close your eyes and visualize it. And put yourself in that scene and be the wall of Cronkite. You're recording now, Jesus is doing this, Jesus all the apostles doing that, and he's doing this. But the reality is, you're letting that picture talk to you. You let that picture influence you. You're letting that picture become real life to you. And that's my point, is that, um, again, well, we're reading this, and we'll be reading some, but you just got to close your eyes and let the pages, let the words talk to you. You got to close your eyes and let the words paint the picture for you. Uh, we get to get to certain things here which are stunningly beautiful. I mean, stunningly beautiful. Uh, if we dare get into Song of Songs, <laughs> that's another story. You, you just got to um, develop a field. I'm sorry, I mean, I've gotten off the track again. I do know why. What's theology? Anybody have an answer? What is theology? All right, if you've taken my class before, you should have an answer. What, Sylvia? What? You said, who said? She said, study of God. What's well, theology? It's a study. Yeah. It's faith seeking understanding. When I when I got my my first degree in school, in, in, in this one of the first questions the teacher up there first said, "What are you here, Bill?" I said, "I really don't know. I'm not here to get a job. I mean, I, I I'm an engineer, so I, I mean, I don't need this for a living." The reality is, I like to understand what I believe. And that's what it came down to. Is faith seeking understanding. And again, that's one of the reasons we're to read in the Bible. It's our faith trying to come up with a deeper understanding of what we believe. So you see that, and again, it's not just us here. This goes back to St. Anselm, who's back to St. Anselm's what, 12th, 13th century, whatever. Um, a lot of our faith was handed to us, that, to our parents. Um, the questions of our faith, I used to be where, I never asked my parents, but my grandparents used to be the compendium, and though it's a minor religious question, there's my grandmother who answered it. All right, uh, my mother did, but my mother was working, she was busy. My grandmother was a little too, too And then we're in the same boat today, we're in the same boat where Hopefully our children and our grandchildren come up to us and ask us questions that we can answer. 